friends, I am Sonal Chakral from Delhi Technological University and in this lecture, I will walk you through a crisp discussion about Richard Thaler, who was conferred with 2017 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his contribution in the area of behavioral economics, the area that challenged the conventional economic theory of rational decision making. The field of behavioral economics applies the findings of psychology and other social sciences into the study of economic behavior. Even though economics is all about studying the behavior of economic agents, the field of behavioral economics recognizes that these agents are humans and non economics who are modeled as completely rational in traditional economic theories. To quote Richard Taylor, supposedly irrelevant factors or SIFs matter a lot and if we economists recognize their importance, we can do our jobs better. Behavioral economics is to a large extent standard economics that has been modified to incorporate SIFs. Behavioral economics studies behavior of real people and not econs that don't exist. Richard Teller is renowned for observing and predicting how people behave in real world that challenged the conventional assumption of rationality. The wave of behavioral economics started with the Nobel Memorial Prize for going to Daniel Kahneman in 2002, Robert Schiller in 2013 and Richard Thaler in 2017, who is now known as father of behavioral economics and it has now been imbibed into the mainstream of economics. Thaler earned his Bachelor of Arts degree with a major in economics at Cass Western Reserve University in 1965 and his master's and PhD degree from the University of Rochester, where he also served as a professor. He joined University of Chicago's Booth School of Business after he left Cornell University. How Thaler's interest arose in behavioral economics. Daniel Kahneman, the recipient of Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2002, and Emma Stowesky, who would have also jointly received the prize had he not died, refuted rational decision making by individuals as advocated by the traditional economic theory. Kahneman and Stowesky advocated the prospect theory, which shows that how people make choices between alternatives that involve risk and uncertainty. Prospect theory was the initial theory that proved the irrationality of individuals. The theory advocated that people tend to overweigh options that are certain and are risk averse for gains called certainty effect. Thus, an individual would prefer an alternative that brings to him a short, lesser win than take the chance of winning more. In an opposite situation, that is when dealing with losses people engage in risk-seeking behavior to avoid a bigger loss. They have a tendency to disregard any elements that are common to both alternatives in an effort to simplify the cognitive load, called isolation effect. They argue people's decisions can be influenced by how the situation is framed or presented, called framing effect. Another bias that comes in the way of rational decision-making is loss aversion, according to which people behave in a manner that they minimize losses because losses loom larger than gains, even though probability of these losses is very less. Prospect theory explains several biases that people rely on when making decisions. Now, when Kahneman and Tversky asked people to hypothetically decide what procedure they would take to cure a disease, most preferred a procedure that saved 80% of people to an alternative that killed 20%. These led to inconsistent choices by individuals. The theory explains the biases that people use when they make such decisions. The breakthrough findings of Kahneman and Tversky aroused interests of various economists, and one of them was Richard Thaler. Thaler defied what was at the core of economic theory, rational decision making. He believed that individuals display the behavior which is at odds with conventional economic thinking. He explains the reasons as to why decision making is not rational and how the people's behavior can be modulated to achieve desirable outcomes. The highlights of his contributions are as follows. First, mental accounting. Richard Thaler's 
paper on mental accounting matters 1999 is considered the most important work on behavioral economics. Taylor's phenomena of mental accounting emanates from the observation that individuals tend to mentally group their expenditures into different categories or accounts, for example, housing, food, clothing, entertainment, etc. And the expenditure in one category cannot be met from another account, suggesting that money is infungible. A dollar from any one account is not equivalent to the dollar of another account. In a survey conducted by Teller and his co-authors, they found evidence that taxi drivers in New York appear to behave as if they try to achieve a specific target income every day. Each working day seems to correspond to a separate mental account for the drivers. And consequently, drivers drive less on days when there is high demand and more on days with low demand. Hence, taxi drivers seem to balance their mental books on a daily basis. Taylor explains it with another example. Let's say you reach a theater and realize that you lost dollar 10 ticket you purchased in advance. Would you spend another dollar 10 to buy a movie ticket? Another scenario, if you lost dollar 10 on way to movie ticket, would you shell out dollar 10 for a movie ticket? The loss in both scenarios is dollar 10. A great percentage of people said they would not spend another dollar 10 in the first scenario, whereas in the second scenario, they would be ready to buy the ticket. This is explained by mental accounting because dollar 20 on movie ticket in first scenario exceeds their earmarked funds for the entertainment account, while in the second scenario, the lost dollar 10 is earmarked for lost money account. If people feel they have overspent in one category, they will delay the expenditure in that account while continue to spending to spend on other items. This mental accounting results in limited rationality in decision making by individuals or groups. Teller explains various non-rational influences on decision making that make these decisions suboptimal. Suboptimal decisions are framed due to limitations of time, information, or cognitive effort. If you can recall, this is similar to Nobel laureate Herbert Simon's bounded rationality. The second contribution or the second uh, concept that uh, Teller talks about is social preferences. Teller propounded that individuals are also influenced by their social preferences, especially their perception of fairness. People may take decisions to punish an economic actor whom they believe has behaved badly. This explains the phenomena that businesses are hesitant to raise their products and or services prices even in case of surging demand. Another aspect that Teller explains is about third, lack of self-control. Teller highlighted lack of self-control as another reason that made the decision-making irrational. Through his planner-doer model, he showed that there is a difference between what individuals plan and what they actually do. For instance, short-term temptations of individuals are the reason why they often fail to save for retirement. Taylor suggests nudge mechanism by which people can exercise self-control. An example of nudging as cited by Taylor in his famous book Nudge is that by placing healthy foods in a school cafeteria at eye level while hiding away less healthy foods does not actually prevent kids from eating what they want. But arranging the food choices that is a suitable choice architecture discourages kids to eat less healthy food and positively enforces healthy eating habits. Small nudges in the way that salespeople operate or present their goods can also influence people's spending. Thus, Nudge proposes positive reinforcement rather than coercion to influence the behavior and decision making of groups or individuals. The next term that Taylor coins is libertarian paternalism. Nudging is based on the idea that Taylor propagates the idea of libertarian paternalism that modulates the behavior of individuals while also respecting their freedom of choice. It is paternalism because it restricts the choice it is libertarian in the sense that it aims to ensure 
that people should be free to opt out of specified arrangements if they choose to do so. The possibility to opt out is said to preserve freedom of choice. They believed that people can be nudged by arranging choice architecture in a certain way without taking away the individual's freedom of choice, just like rearranging healthy food in school's cafeteria. Coming to um, uh, behavioral economics and public policy, Taylor's comprehension, especially his nudge theory, has been imbibed extensively by governments in framing and enforcing public policies. Some countries have even established nudge units to improve the public policy. Taylor was instrumental in the creation of the UK's Behavioral Insights Team in 2010, also known as Nudge Unit, that exists to tackle many of society's major problems with the theory of nudge. The governments are now resorting to this mechanism to regulate the behavior of people. In US, the contribution to retirement plans by people was very, very less. Taylor suggested automatic enrollment of employees into the pension plans and making them to opt out rather than giving them an option to choose between the two alternatives, which has massively increased the number of people under pension plans. To quote Richard Taylor, customers are busy, lazy, and often confused. They are surprisingly likely to take whatever option is made the default. To further increase the contribution to pension plans, Taylor also suggested automatic escalation through the system of save. Now, in US, more than half of the companies adopt both automatic enrollment and automatic escalation. Taylor is known for making economics more human by integrating economics with psychology and which is widely used in public policy. Taylor explains the irrationality of human beings through his copiously annotated book, Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth and Happiness, which has been named as one of the best books of 2008 by The Economist, wherein he elucidates various anomalies that influence decision-making that has challenged the conventional economic theory of decision-making. Taylor's biggest contribution lies in the field of behavioral economics and applying it to the field of behavioral finance and eventually to the financial markets. Taylor made an appearance in the film The Big Shot in which he used behavioral economics to help explain the causes of the financial crisis. Now, coming to some learnings from the life of Nobel laureate Richard Taylor. Research cannot be done in vacuum. Taylor built his work over the findings of previous eminent researchers and Nobel laureates, deep discussions with his mentor, Daniel Kahneman. The more you discuss, the more you learn, the more you broaden the horizon of your research. The starting point of new Nobel laureate is where an earlier Nobel laureate pauses, progressing and advancing the body of knowledge. Second, Richard Taylor was not formally trained in psychology and developing a revolutionary idea just requires one to be endlessly curious. The third thing we see from the life of Richard Taylor is courage to believe in your idea. With the huge criticism he attracted from the economists with his heresy ideas, he continued to do what he believed in. It was to the extent that initially Richard Thaler could not easily find a publisher for his book, best-selling book, Nudge. I would wrap up by saying that to wake up sometimes all we need is a nudge. Nudge is any small feature in the environment that attracts our attention and influences the behavior that we make. Nudging is done by what we call a choice architect, which is a fancy term for anyone who influences the choices that you make. Take the example of the cafeteria downstairs. Somebody had to decide where to put the salad bar, where to put the burgers, where to put the ice cream, where to put the coffee. That person is a choice architect because the arrangement of the food 
influences the choices that we make. So for example, in our cafeteria, you have to go buy the salad bar to get to the burgers. That increases the chance that you're gonna go for the salad, which is a good thing. So another domain in which we see nudges is in safety. There's a beautiful road here in Chicago called Lakeshore Drive, and there's a dangerous S-curve right downtown where people are constantly wiping out. So what the city's done is painted lines on the road, and as you drive up to the most dangerous part of the curve, the lines are closer together, which gives you the illusion that you're speeding up, so you tap the brake and slow down, which is exactly what you want to do. You've been nudged. Yeah, some people worry that uh, the idea of choice architects and nudging is somehow leading to Big Brother. And that's not the way we think about it. One of the points we stress in the book is that there has to be some choice architecture. So the person who designs that cafeteria downstairs has to put the food somewhere. The salad has to be in front of the burgers or behind the burgers. Given that you have to arrange the food in some order, we argue, why not have the choice architect arrange the food in such a way that people will be happier and healthier and maybe live a little longer. Thank you for listening to the lecture.